Hello all and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 429th New Social Environment. I'm Anya, the events assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Radcliffe Bailey and Ksenia Sobaleva. We're thrilled to have the poet Isabel Sobral Campos here, who will read the work of Salette Tavares as your translator to close today's program. A few quick notes before we get started. Here at the Whit Rail, we're celebrating our 21st anniversary by working on our first ever endowment campaign. This initiative will ensure the print edition of the Rail and our public programming celebrating cross-pollination in the arts, humanities, and sciences all remains free and accessible for generations to come. Please check the chat for more information and links, which I'll post shortly. And the Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on the Nape Hoking the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions also to be posted shortly. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Painter, sculptor, and mixed media artist Radcliffe Bailey utilizes the layering of imagery, culturally resonant materials and text to explore themes of ancestry, race, migration, and collective memory. His work often incorporates found materials and objects from his past into textured compositions, including traditional African sculpture, tintypes of his family members, ships, train tracks, and Georgia red clay. Often quilt-like in aesthetic, his practice creates links between diasporic histories and potential futures invest investigating the evolution or stagnation of notions of identity. And New York City-based writer, art historian, and curator Ksenia M. Soboleva is based in New York City and received her PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts, NYU, with a dissertation on art and lesbian identity during the AIDS crisis. Soboleva has curated ex ex exhibitions at La Mama, Galleria, Assembly Room, and Honeys, among others. She has taught at NYU and the Cooper Union, and her writings have appeared in Hyperallergic, The Brooklyn Rail, Art Agenda, QED, and various exhibition catalogs. She was a 2020-2021 Marika and Jen Vilcek Curatorial Fellow at the Guggenheim Museum, where she co-organized the Jillian Waring Retrospective that opened last week. So please, Ksenia and Radcliffe, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anya, and thank you to everyone for making this happen. I'm very excited. Uh, Radcliffe, I'm so honored to be in conversation with you. And I wanted to start um, by looking at some images of your current show at Jack Shaman, um, okay. Ascents and Echoes. And I wanted to ask you how um, you arrived at this title. Oh, yeah. Well, um, arriving at the title was really based on echoes from the past of um, from the past, but then also past work. Um, ascent was really um, based on rising and ascending, and I use a lot of uh, references to railroad tracks, but I also play with the idea of the railroad tracks turning into to different things, like the railroad tracks turn into ladders, but they also turn into DNA strands. So it's a mixture of different things, but it's also inspired by the music of John Coltrane, um, as well as a particular album, which was called Sonship. And there were references to Ascent. I think that was actually one of the one of the actual songs, pieces that's played on, um, on the album. Mm. And we can go through them a little bit, yeah. Okay. Next. And it's and it's in two venues. Um, it's in both of the Jack Shaman galleries, one, one on 22nd and one on 24th. And yeah. um, Radcliffe, I'm, I'm so captivated by the ways in which you use objects, either from your personal archive or from a collective archive really as containers of, of memory. And uh, those who are familiar with your earlier work know that you often incorporate personal photographs. And in 1992, during your last year of art school, your, your grandmother gifted you 400 tintypes 
uh, dating back to the late 1800s and over the years you've been incorporating those into your works um, mainly in the body of work that you refer to as medicine cabinets uh, which we can return to uh, later as well and you've mentioned that at this point you've run out of the photographs but uh, this exhibition so there are no no personal photographs in this exhibition except the door of no return which we'll return to but um but it's the exhibition is still very rich in in objects and materials that um that speak to your ancestry and that carry the history of migration um which is so representative of your practice at large and i was hoping we could um highlight and zoom in on a couple of works starting with uh king snake Mm -hmm. uh, when I when I visited the exhibition, this work really stood out to me because it's so it's so subtle and almost delicate, and so much of your work is about layering and and weaving that that this work seemed uh, strangely and, and beautifully exposed, and there was a cer certain vulnerability to it. And you mentioned that this was actually the first sculpture that you made during the pandemic. So I was wondering whether, you know, with the snake, whether you were thinking about medicine and, and the pandemic. Um, so could you speak a little bit about, about that? Well, I think snakes are beautiful, <laughs> but I don't like snakes. Um, and I think pretty much at the beginning of the pandemic, I, um, when, everyone was, when everyone was locking down, I decided to go back to making sculpture. So I, I basically bought a welder and I went back to working in metal. And the, probably the last time I even worked in metal was when I was in college. And so as I'm working, I'm working out in the back of, back of my studio. I just remember as I'm walking out in the back of my studio, I see this rubber hose and I'm assuming it's a rubber hose, but it was actually a snake. And so for me, it was um, referencing that snake, but referencing that snake in different ways. I think like what we see in the medical signs, we see like the two snakes that run together, but it's also um, in a reference to um, Haiti, I'm referring to Dambala. And so I'm, I'm making these references to a lot of different things, but then also um, my interest in um, self-taught artists, one in particular, um, Bill Trailer. So it's a reference to Bill Trailer snake, um, Philip Simmons, who, who is someone who was a blacksmith in Charleston, um, made, made beautiful gate work and metal work. And it's a reference to him. And let me see, in the other reference, I make a reference to a song um, based around a king snake and a black snake, a king snake um, by Lightning Hopkins. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he talks about it. But, you know, it's for me, it was just, you know, a real simple, you know, exclamation. And it was just a, a, a moment um, when, I, when I began making the work, but a moment when I ended making the work as well. It does almost look like an exclamation point now that you mention it. Right, um, and, the, and the snake is actually made out of, uh, the head of the snake is made out of a railroad spike. Hmm. And there are parts of it where the bends are actually uh, parts of the railroad spike as well. Yeah, and, and the shadow, I think somebody just mentioned in the chat as well, casts like three heads. The three-headed snake. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Um, and then the largest uh, piece in the exhibition uh, is a piece titled of Namo, um, which refers to an ancestral um, spirit, correct? Right. And um, you first created this piece for the 2019 Istanbul Biennial. Um, could you speak a bit, a bit to that process and how this work came to be? Right. Um, this work was, you know, it was fabricated and created in Istanbul. It was, a, you know, it was, it was supposed to be shown in the old shipping yard. And so basically I collected materials from the shipping yard and recreated a ship. It's really based around a, a bottom of a ship. There's some references to the Clotilda which was a ship that was sunk in illegal, an illegal, or well, slavery was illegal to me, period, but an illegal ship during the slave trade 
when the slave trade had ended, but this ship was sunk in the Mobile Bay. And so it's a reference to that. But then also when I think about that and I think about somewhere like Alabama, there's also a reference to Sun Ra. And Sun Ra, as many, I, I know many people um, who are listening now are familiar with Sun Ra, but Sun Ra was a jazz musician who basically believed in that he was from outer space. And he um, believed that he was, he referred to himself as Sun Ra, but you know, it's also, uh, a reference to a performance that Sun Ra did in Istanbul, where he played on the back of a truck driving through the streets of Istanbul. Um, you also, on top of that, on top of the ship, you have like bust. Those are busts that, um, that are collected from a, a dealer who was dealing with antiques from Belgium. And basically the bust itself, I um, poured and cast and, bust itself was supposed to be a death mask and so that with the death mask and you know the particular um, being it from Belgium that meant that those that actual bust was probably somewhere from the Congo and so that's that's a reference um, that's in it too um, there's a radio um, that's playing um, it's playing June Tyson um, singing if you find earth boring same old same thing and sign up for Outer Space Ways Incorporated. And so you have that plan. And the, I basically created more like a radio station of playing different sounds. And another a friend of mine, um, a jazz musician, um, bass player named Taurus Mantine. He was someone who I've um, known since I um, finished college. And he would often come to my studio and play to my work and I would paint to his sounds. And so it's an incorporation of that as well as the sounds of the ocean and the sounds of trains and um, a constant movement and migration. But as I, just as I was mentioned earlier, as I see it as the bottom of a ship, but I also see it as a spaceship as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this work is so uh, exemplary of the, the important role that music plays to your creative practice. And this was particularly uh, palpable in your installation, um, Windward Coast, which has received so much attention over time and it has had several iterations. Um, so it's essentially 3,500 discarded piano keys that are shaped like the waves of an ocean. And then there is a, there's an isolated floating uh, bust of, of, of a black man. And it's, you always use the same mold, right? For all the, all the busts. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I would love, and then there is a soundtrack of the keys falling. And I think it's interwoven with, with other sounds as well. And I'd love to hear, um, well, firstly about your relationship to this work uh, and also more generally about your relationship to music and how it has evolved over time. Well, um, I will admit one thing. I don't know how to play one single instrument. I can whistle, <laughs> but I don't know how to play a single instrument. If I, I, you know, I dream. I have an upright bass in my studio and I, I, don't, um, I don't profess to know how to play it. But whenever I'm in a situation when I'm working on a painting and I feel as if I'm stuck, I'll go and play with the bass and realize how difficult that is and then realize I need to stick back, get, jump back onto that painting. And it's almost like a problem solving thing. So music has always become somewhat of, um, somewhat of an ingredient for my work or some type of seasoning that's added to, towards my work. I often um, listen, listen to music while I'm working, um, just different, all different types of musicians. Often I prefer those, uh, I prefer no vocals. But, but the piece itself um, is, you know, I think you said 3,500 piano keys, often referred to as 400 sets of piano keys. I don't know, 400 sounds like a, a good number. And basically I'm imagining how many people have touched those piano keys. And I realize that that's the one thing that kind of connects those, those of, you know, in this country. Um, throughout the United, throughout the southern part of the United States, the United States in general, in terms of connecting towards the um, 
the continent is um, there's a common thread of music and sounds and, and rhythms. And so I am kind of playing back and forth with that. And it's based, it's called Wimmerick Coast and based on someone who was lost at sea. And it's installed um, several different ways. Um, sometimes I spread it out open and spread it across the floor where it's even and calm. And sometimes I respond to things that um, are happening in the world in terms of even with the climate change. And I think it was like a tsunami. And I remember just responding to that and installing it with heavy waves and the waves are crashing on walls as if it was coming throughout spaces. Um, it changes just been upon where it's shown. I've shown it um, in Colombia. I've shown it in Dakar. And uh, each time I've shown it in different ways. And also there's a ship uh, that appears to be caught in, caught in a storm. It also refers to another piece that I work with with Piano Keys, which is called Storm at Sea. And it was based upon a Yoruba deity named Shango. And I did attributes for Shango with thunder and lightning. And so I really wanted to cause, you know, the, what if, it was a question, what if Shango caused a big storm and, and carried those, those were lost at sea. But I'm also fascinated with uh, uh, the slave trade routes and then based on the slave trade routes and the places where the storms happen to this day. And where do you source the discarded piano keys? Oh. <laughs> well, when I first started, um, I stored them in my studio and I have a container where I keep them, but um, in different places. And a reason why I even started working with the piano keys was based around um, a piano shop that's around the corner from my house. And I often, as a kid, I would walk by it. And I just remember one day walking and um, into the piano shop and they were discarding the piano keys and they were burning them. And I just, I asked, I said, stop, just give them to me. And I just brought them straight to the studio. Didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but as, as soon as I brought them to the studio and I stacked them and dropped them on the ground, I realized that was the piece. Mm, yeah. And, and, and the history, like you say, the history of touch embedded in every piece, it's, it's such a, it's such a beautiful metaphor. Um, mm -hmm. And then there is another piece that I wanted to highlight if we go to the next one. Um, so I think that, um, you know, you are one of the most renowned artists whose work has since the 90s uh, addressed the history of slavery and the African diaspora, but you do so through, um, through very poetic and, and spiritual registers and um, you've said to me that, um, you know, just because something is a commentary on a painful past doesn't mean that it can't be beautiful. And, um, and so your work employs imagery of the ocean and, and, and of railroad tracks, but it, it evokes the Middle Passage and the Underground Railroad. Um, but there is one work in, in, in this exhibition where uh, I noticed that it, it seems to be a more direct commentary on the current state of our, uh, of this country. Um, and it's titled Slow Blues. And so I, I was wondering if you could speak to uh, what you were trying to convey to, with this work. Well, Slow Blues kind of came about, you know, around the time of, uh, I was thinking about Stacey Abrams and I was, I was also thinking about, you know, living and living in the South or living in Atlanta. Living in Atlanta is different than living in Georgia. I can tell you that for a fact. And Slow Blues was basically just, you know, really referring to how we slowly have turned blue. Um, but it also um, refers to certain parts of the United States, which I have always, I've always thought of it as one state. I've never really like, I'm not really dealing with the battles of the Civil War, but I'm just dealing with the fact that I have always considered certain parts of the United States, especially in the South, as one particular state, one particular place um, that I've always been fascinated with. And so the piece is dealing with, I've used indigo, and you know, there's also that heavy um, loaded meaning behind indigo, using it as a, as a crop during slavery, um, and also just the blues. 
And um, so it's a mixture of all that. And it's in a, it's in a cabinet, it's not a frame. I refer, them, refer, them, refer to them as medicine cabinets. And the idea was that whenever you get sick, you go to the medicine cabinet and get something, get something to make you feel better. But for me, it was always uh, go to the medicine cabinet for memory. And mm -hmm. I refer to memory as medicine. Um, but it's, you know, it's also like uh, there's reflective qualities on the glass and some of those reflective qualities are meant to repel, um, like a mirror, um, almost like the uh, uh, Congolese figures are called the Kisi. Um, and they have like a glass stomach and part of it's medicine within it and part of it's supposed to repel the glass or the mirror. And so that's what the piece is mm -hmm. um, about for me. And the press release actually mentions that this exhibition sort of signifies uh, your move um, away from figuration and more into abstraction. But I found that there, there still is a lot of figuration in the show, obviously, but also that the, um, you know, the abstract shapes, they, they almost echo the, the photographs that, that you were using right. earlier. And so um, was this, were you, was it a conscious move into abstraction or uh, mm. was that statement in the press release a surprise to you? Mm. <laughs> well, you know, I think that um, the photograph has always been um, a way in which I can hold a certain audience. A photograph was really about connecting to those that were closest to me, those that are not necessarily art goers, those, you know, they don't go to museums, my friends that, you know, we could, or older people who can draw a relationship to those images of that particular time period. Um, I did that on purpose because of when my grandmother gave me those photographs early on when I finished school. I realized right then and there, my grandmother was talking to me in a, in a way, and I felt like it was important for me to incorporate that. And so I've always worked in this way, um, which you can, which people may refer to as just a more abstract and less figurative. Um, but I've always dealt with the figure because I, when I think about the figure, I think about my own personal scale and how I can stretch this far, how I can climb this high and deal with certain scales. Or like if I make a painting that's five foot eight, that's really based around my height. Um, so it's, it's always been there in terms of just the way in which I work and the movement and the making that was always there, but it was always covered by a photograph just to hold the support or to deal with the memories of those images that may become discarded. Because often you'll see these photographs and they're in antique shops and they're places and the families don't necessarily have them, but I, I wanted to honor those particular family members. So I, I worked to a point where I stopped. And when, I, when I've used the images that were part of my family and I allow them to be, and sometimes those images pop back up and they become more like deities and they represent um, different characters. I have one particular image where I have a guy who has a top hat and his top hat is tilted to the side and his eyes are almost like ghostly like and he sits in a rocking chair and I, I refer to him almost like a trickster uh, and referring to like Eshu, which was would be more like a guardian of the crossroads. And you have um, you have lived in Atlanta um, for the majority of your life. Right. What is your relationship to the city and have you ever thought of leaving? And if so, what what has made you stay? <laughs> You know, I've always thought about leaving. I think the thing that really pretty much holds me here is that my mother and father are here, my brother, and we're very close. Uh, my mother and father live two blocks away from me. Um, I watch them. I, um, I look after them. Um, and I just feel close. I don't know. There's a certain kind of, is when you grow up in a city that, you know, you, you can kind of walk down the same trails or paths that you've crossed when you were four years old. There's something about it. You know, the, you know, grew up, growing up in a city like Atlanta, you have like a large African-American community um, of politicians, doctors, 
you know, it's the home of Martin Luther King. It's, uh, it's you know, um, Abernathy, um, Joseph Lowry. I can go down the list of on and on, you know, African-American mayors. And I've kind of grown up with, you know, with that community. And some of, some of the mayors were my friends. And so it's, um, it's one of those things you just, you know, it feels like home. And I've always been tempted to uh, move to New York or had an interest in moving to New York, but it was also a little difficult for me because I don't know, I think I, it, there was a certain point in my life when I first started showing work, I was a junior in college. And I kind of had somewhat of an early start and I made a decision not to go to grad school, but, but to just stay and stick towards making work and just work nonstop. Um, it wasn't because I, I live here, it was because of a gallery system. It wasn't a gallery system. Um, the one thing that we have that's one of the most beautiful things in the world to me, we have a big airport. And we have a big airport so I can go anywhere. I mean, you know, before we were, you know, doing social media and internet, that airport was that connector to me. So that's kind of what keeps me here. And you did an installation at the airport, no? Yeah, I have, um, I think one of my first commissions was was at the, um, at the airport. It was like in 95. 95 96 right before the olympics mm -hmm. and it was it was a big commission and i just i was kind of thrown in the loop to do the commission and it was it was awesome but it was also a lot of pressure because at the time i had to make this this painting that was 20 by 40 feet and it hangs above an escalator and it was happening right before the olympics mm -hmm. so and it was a whole different time back then so. And also, your your isn't your backyard the site of what wasn't the site of civil war? Yeah, there's. Um, I live on right behind a Cascade Springs Nature Preserve, and in the Nature Preserve, which was the Battle of Utoy Creek, and the Battle of Utoy Creek was there were troops that were camped in the um, in my backyard, and um, there's a there's a whole kind of rich, strange history behind um, behind the nature preserve. I mean, first and foremost, you know, dealing with the indigenous of this area, but to deal with a battle, um, you know, where lives were lost within this creek and living on the property. And then in the middle, you think about civil war, but then you also think about you know, I'm in a neighborhood where there are a lot of civil rights leaders. And so there's a there's a uh, interesting thing that goes on within this uh, the nature preserve behind me. But it's um, it's also beautiful. It's also uh, a place where I find where I'm at peace. Yeah, it's interesting that you that you literally live on layers of history, and then your work is also layering. Right and weaving together all these histories. And at the same time, um, you know, just the, the aesthetic strategy of collage also speaks to the, uh, displacement and, and fragmentation. And um, what is it like to have that daily confrontation with, um, with history? Hmm. I don't know. I actually don't even, I, I feel like I'm almost, uh, I'm dabbling, uh, you know, one foot in the past and one foot in the present. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting going out in the backyard and digging up Georgia clay and realizing you know, you're thinking about the lives that were lost and the blood that was shed. But then you also think about um, Native Americans and you there's a whole thing that goes on. And it's it's weird. It's almost like. Um, it's almost like the relationship where I go and I work with those old photographs in the past. It's almost like I'm trying to read within those materials or those photographs and trying to understand what may have happened back then or, or reading a, a face or a gesture or, or um, the way someone's dressed. If they're dressed as if they were coming from a funeral or 
they were celebrating something, you know. Um, it's interesting though, you know, I, I've had some photographs where there are people that are standing at a beach and they're in a circle. And I didn't really know exactly what they were doing, but they were dressed in their Sunday's best. They may have been dealing with, um, you know, one of those things, a funeral, uh, maybe in the birth of a child, I, I wouldn't know. But I respond to those kind of things and I try to create a story, but I don't necessarily try to, I'm not trying to be literal about the story. Um, I feel like we live in between two different worlds, one world of things that are tangible and one world that things that are not tangible. And I feel like we're, we kind of like live in our dreams and catch hell during the day. It's a whole strange space, but I, I hope I answered that question. Yeah, no, it was beautiful. Thank you. Um, can you go to the next slide, Anya? Oh, yes. Yes. Something that I, that I wanted to ask you about um, that I noticed is that your work often evo evokes movements through the railroad tracks, the ocean, uh, but at the same time, there is a certain negation of that movement. So this rock, for example, is, is weighing it down. Um, your father, I don't know if we already mentioned this, your father was a railroad engineer. Um, right. So it's, it's, it's not only a, um, a reference to the Underground Railroad, it's a reference to your father, to your personal history. Um, can you speak to this tension between movement, but at the same time, this negation of that movement? Right. Well, um, I feel like we've always been moving back and forth, you know, like referring to just like migration. We've always moved from north to south to east to west. We've crossed, we've crossed the ocean, um, you know, like this. I'll, I'll just speak a little bit about this piece. Um, I made it for my daughter. Uh, so the initials are OWB, Olivia Wilhelmina Bailey. And the track, uh, it goes up, it goes around, it kind of plays on the Congo Cosmograms. And, you know, the boulder, the rock itself um, was a rock that was taken from out the nature preserve behind me because there, in this nature preserve, there was a quarry. And a lot of the granite and things that you see on state monuments they were taken from these different areas. And so I used that and I dipped the um, granite into indigo. And um, yeah. And, and then the next one? On the and, I, and, okay. it was, and it was almost like a crucifix too. I wasn't <laughs> really being specific about it, but uh, things kind of happen in the shadows. Yeah, I'm not much of a religious person. Um, you know, I don't really, I think the only religion I have is really in my studio. And that's where I kind of find a place to pray. Which has no windows, right? Your studio? Right, no windows. <laughs> what made you, uh, what informed that decision? I didn't want any windows because I wanted to have enough wall space to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so another thing that I noticed is the, is the use of tabby right. uh, throughout the show. Uh, so a lot of boulders, rocks, and then tabby. What made you uh, interested in that material and where do you source it? Well, tabby it really came about from um, trips that I would take with my mother and my father and my brother. We would go up and down the coast uh, from the Carolinas all the way down to Florida. And I just, I remember this material. I would, you would see it on, sometimes you would see the shells on the walkways, but then also there were um, quarters on the plantations or those that were enslaved um, had built these quarters and the quarters were made with the, with the tabby. And I just remember that experience. And I remember the shells and, you know, burning the, sh hearing about you burn the shells, and you crush them and create lime and sand and it kind of creates like a concrete structure and I remember it's, it and it was porous and it was um but I remember seeing that but also know that you trace through uh North Africa Spain and also like it's said in some places where um those that are indigenous of, of Americas would use it as well Mm -hmm. And so it's a reference to that, but I remember on one particular 
plantation. I remember on Cumberland Island, there was there was one area where these there were chimneys that were actually, you know, that was the only thing that was left. And I remember looking over one particular chimney and there was a conch shell within the chimney around the tabby. And what it said to me was um, that particular person's place and their, their spirituality. Mm -hmm. And you first traveled to Africa in 2006. Um, Anya, can you go to the next image? And this work, Door of No Return, that's in the current show, in this work, you kind of revisit an older work that you made in, in 2006 um, of the same title. The photograph is, is a personal photograph that you took, and then uh, it's surrounded by what I see as a constellation, evokes outer space and, and sunra. Um, right. how, was, how was this work informed by your travel to, to Africa? Uh, it was uh, really based around going to Senegal and Dakar and then going to uh, Gori Island. And I just remember that experience. And then, you know, most people, you know, when they're gone, um, they're going to go visit Gori Island and just to understand where that last step um, onto a ship. And so I wanted to recreate it, um, but I also wanted to deal with these other places, um, unknown places, out of space. Um, and so there's a, a glittery screen that's mixed with gl glittery and black sand. And the black sand was just kind of referencing like black sand beaches, like in places like Jamaica. But um, the photograph itself, um, that's not a photograph that's in, um, in, from Senegal, but that's a photograph I took when I was in Cuba. Uh, I took it when I was in Havana and I just remember Number one, as you make it work, you never really know exactly what's going to happen. Sometimes you can't really predict it. I think if you can predict it, it's kind of like it's too easy. And so for me, uh, after um, thinking about the photograph, I, at one time, I think I even mentioned like, yeah, this is from Senegal. Just, you know, create my own little secret about it. But it, I, I gladly admit that it's from Cuba because right now I look at it in terms of those that are of African descent that were in Cuba as well as other places. So looking at it from a different direction. So there, there's often these references to slave trade, but I also look at it in a, in a totally different way. I see the pain and I understand the pain and, and all of it's very surreal and to just completely understand, but I also, and, you know, just very fascinated back at the time when I uh, took the trip to Senegal, I was tracing my mother's, my mother's DNA and I traced it to Sierra Leone and Guinea. And so there's that, uh, there's that reference to that, but then also being in that dark space and thinking about outer space and those and constellations and how people travel by night. And do you find that you often revisit earlier works? And I think that maybe we can look at a few images at this point of um, what was your largest uh, exhibition to date at uh, the High Museum. And right. these, these are the pieces that, um, that you would also refer to as medicine cabinets. I also wanted, I don't think I've actually asked you what, what first made you interested in the medicine cabinet as a, as a form. I mean, you mentioned that it's where you go to, where you go to feel better. Though a lot of medicine is, is bad for you too. I was just thinking about African art and, and conceptually like, you know, different ways in which I can approach things or uh, I'm interested in, in holding and keeping secrets too. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, very, that's a very important part of my work. I feel like I, I tell but so much about the work, but just like those objects, um, It'd be at different parts of Africa, you'll see different objects, but we never really know the true story behind those objects. We know them, we speak about them in form, but we don't really know exactly why or exactly who the person that it was made for. So I think about it in that way where I, I like to hold on to my own personal secrets within work. And because I feel like it, when you do that, you kind of hold a certain amount of power with it. And I think there's a mystery about it. And I, I enjoy that. And I hope 
that there are certain works that I make that can hold that. Yeah, yeah, cer certain works should have, right. we, we shouldn't ask questions about. No, I don't mind, but <laughs> but there's one no, I see. Yeah. That, that one in the background, that's a, a, that's a, a baby grand and it's a, it's a piano that on the inside there are um, piano keys, but there's also planets on the inside. And over top of where the keys are, there's a, a plexiglass blue glaze that shines over top of it. And what it does, it appears as if you're looking inside of a fish tank. And my whole thing with that was the idea of, uh, you know, the deeper you go into the sea, it's just like as deep as you go into outer space. Mm. Um, will you go to the next image? I, know. I wanted to ask you about this for, for very selfish reasons that mainly I wish I had visited it. And uh, because as I understand, it was an immersive sound experience um, and it was, um, you did it at the school, Jack Shaman's up, Upstate um, Gallery, and but also at a few other places, correct? Uh, yeah, Prospect Prospect um, commissioned me um, to do it, uh, and it was done right on the Mississippi, and it was right between a uh, train track and railroad tracks and the uh, Mississippi. And I worked with. I wanted to make it look like a. a a stack on top of a ship. And I work with some uh, architects um, named Max Scoggin and Merrill Elam. And I work with them to design it. And I create it in such a way where you can kind of go in the back of it and walk around and can set up a stereo system where it's invisible, you can't see. And I ran sound through a conch shell. And I also commissioned um, a young musician to um, play over top of it. Um, I wouldn't say he's young, but he's a, a musician that I've known here. His name is O'Corey, and um, he played cello. And basically, I invited him to come and visit me at my house. And basically, on a full moon, I uh, made a fire in the back in the woods. I made a fire. I um, recorded him playing over top of the fire. And so it's the sounds of the fire popping on a full moon with insects. You can hear cicadas in the background, but then you can also hear the sounds of the street and you'll hear cars in the background going by in a distance, like a distant drum going down. And that's someone's speaker around midnight going through the neighborhood. But then also you'd hear the sounds of dogs and basically barking at a distance. And you would think about it, you, there's also the sounds of the ocean. And as the ocean goes, it, you start to hear slowly come into the sounds of a locomotion, like a train going through. And then um, you kind of fade into the insects. And it was really about someone, the history of crossing the Atlantic and um, migrating from south to north and using that train and the sounds of a dog and someone escaping. And so it's, it's a combination of all those different thoughts. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're working on a site-specific installation, uh, on a few site-specific installations um, right, right now. And the sound comes out the shell at the top. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, I think the, yes, so this is gonna be at uh, Greensboro in North Carolina. Right, this is at Greensboro, this is in Greensboro and it's a, a piece based around the subject of freedom and I, I, what I basically am doing like a, a 30 foot railroad, 30 foot long railroad track in the sky. Um, there are other parts that are a part of it, uh, which is a neon star at the top, like the North Star. Um, and it's, you know, it's really based on the subject of freedom. The layout on the ground is based around a Dogon ladder. So it has this Y shape and it goes in different directions. Uh, and uh, there's sound elements to it as well. Uh, I'm still working on that. And it's almost like an area for performance. And so I'm doing that, but I'm also collaborating with a landscape architect to design stuff. And the base of the piece is changing and the base is gonna turn into almost like the bottom of a ship. 
So it's almost like as if you're walking around the bottom of a ship. And what's it like to be working on site-specific installations versus being in your studio? Um, I enjoy being outside the studio. The studio can be a little confining. I mean, it's, I, I like being out in nature. I like, you know, interacting with people. I like work that's outside of uh, white walls. Um, um, that's a good feeling to be able to put your fingerprint somewhere. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Are you making a move to doing more installations? Because there's another one that you're working on right now. Uh, right. And this is in your backyard. Right. Or yeah, the nature so preserve that's essentially your backyard. Yeah, it, it yeah, connects to nature preserve. But I, would, I don't know, I was thinking about um, uh, making a place like an amphitheater, but it's really based on the local musicians that live within uh, community and I wanted to create a space where uh, DJs, musicians could actually perform and play. Someone could probably get married in it as well, but I really wanted to create a space that um, can do several things. Uh, on, one, on the back part of it, um, there's an area where, you know, someone could sell produce. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm pretty much just trying to figure out different ways. And I think a lot of times, Artists, a lot of artists want to be architects and art, architects want to be artists. And so I'm finding myself in that space and I've always been fascinated. So, you know, it's really based around, uh, it's made out of cast concrete. Um, so it's doing a, a couple things, so, but yeah. And when does this, when does this open? Uh, this is gonna probably, it's, been in the mix for you know public commissions are complicated it's been it's been going on for almost four years mm. and but that's sometimes happens when you deal with a city and as well as a some a private situation um, you have to go through a lot of stuff that makes no sense to you you have mm -hmm. to deal with the arborists you, know, you gotta you can't dig but so far you can't do with this but um i enjoy it and i think i'm i'm learning a lot about it um you know even at the parts that i don't really care too much for uh, it's a good it's a good experience i think this would be a good note to maybe start opening it up but um i have one last question that that i wanted to ask you though i think maybe i do know the answer already um if you could play an instrument which one would it be and why if I could play an instrument, I would play uh, upright bass. That's what I thought because you mentioned uh, it was. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I think it's the closest to a drum, and um, yeah, I, and I just admire, I just enjoy the sound of the bass. Mm. So, I'm gonna start listening to more bass after this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Radcliffe, thank you so much. Yeah, thank this you. Was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. Uh, yeah, this has been really, truly so wonderful um, to hear you walk through your work. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, our first question is going to come from Jeffrey Wolf. <laughs> we've, asked, we've asked and answered a few questions to each other over the years, um, but um, you know, I, you were talking about the medicine chest, but you also often talk about um, the blanket chest and the kind of the, the search for what's left behind. So I'm wondering in all the layers of what you do, if you take words like ancient and hereditary and history and ancestry, like do those words exist as individual layers for you or are they all, um, part of the same thing? I think they're part of the same thing. I think they are. Um, it just depends upon uh, what I'm actually working on at the moment. Sometimes it, sometimes it changes, sometimes layers of, layers of thought, sometimes it's actual physical layers, and sometimes it's layers of, layers of history. Um, I don't know if I answer your question. And in my roundabout those are, way, those are, those are basically the elements. But but I have right. one. I have, 
have one question for you that uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I re recently read a quote about Sun Ra that when, the, when they had the moon landing and Neil Armstrong was going to land on the moon, uh, they went around to a bunch of different people and asked them what, what they would say, what Neil Armstrong should say when he stepped foot on the moon. And Sun Ra was one of the people who they asked. So I'm wondering from your point of view, like, <laughs> When we set foot on Mars, what should the astronauts say for the first time to the rest of the world? <laughs> I'm not sure, man. That's a hard one. <laughs> I couldn't answer that one. Space, no. is, space is the place or something? Space like is the place, right. <laughs> All right. I, I knew that that was a tough one. Um, cool. <laughs> passing on the baton. <laughs> Thanks, Jeffrey. <laughs> um, our next question will come from Lynn Crawford. You can turn on your microphone. Hi. Thank you so much. This is just really profound and moving and um, very provoking, thought provoking, heart provoking. And I just, I kept thinking when you said that memories are like medicine but then I was also thinking that sometimes memories can be very um, difficult. Mm -hmm. And when I was, and I look at some of the spaces that you shared with us, and I, I connected that those spaces as offering sites where uh, a human might feel um, safe to spend time with memories or even uncover them because there seemed some kind of multi-spheric element to them. Right, right. I agree. I mean, I agree. I agree. I don't, you know, sometimes I, I don't really consciously think about, you know, those spaces. It's, it's funny. It's just like the act of making is, has become the most important, important part for me. And I enjoy it when my work does something for someone else and brings someone within a certain place or, you know, there's a very difficult and painful um, subject matters, but I also believe that um, beauty is almost like the best um, form of medicine um, for someone to share. And it's also sometimes when you make something, I always believe that you, you, you can make it so personal that it can become universal. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I've, I've only seen them, you know, online. I haven't even been in them and I'm very touched by them. So I look forward to seeing them. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, the next question we have is from our very own Malvika. Thank you so much, Anya, and thank you, Radcliffe. This has been an amazing conversation. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the iconography of the ladder and the hold of a ship or the bottom of the slave ship. Uh, Catherine in the comments writes um, that Tibetans have ladders in their iconography, ladders to heaven, and that makes sense for their sort of spiritual iconography. And looking at your the ladder that you have and the space that you're creating, it reminded us so much of Martin Poirier's ladder for Booker T. Washington, which is... Um, right you know, a very similar ladder, but it's an optical illusion. It would be impossible to climb and has a very different kind of, um, to me, like a very different kind of like atmosphere than yours. I was wondering if you could talk about how those two, those two images, those two objects relate to one another. Right. Well, I think of, uh, I think of a ladder. Um, well, when I was a student, I remember making work where I, use um, found ladders and I would wrap bar barbed wire around the top of the ladders, almost like a halo. Um, but the ladder for me and the railroad track, they're one, they're one within the same. And, um, you know, even though, you know, railroad track runs flat on the ground, it was really about, um, you know, about the underground railroad, but raising up above and climbing. And also the ladder itself, um, in other works, uh, it would turn into a DNA strand. So the ladder would twist. Um, 
but I don't, I didn't, you know, I never really thought about them as ladders. I really just thought of it, you know, more as like the railroad track ascending. So, yeah, and then the, the ship, um, it's kind of like, a, you know, the slave ships are very painful kind of imagery. Um, and I just remember, you know, even current recently talking about the discovery of the Clotilda in the Mobile Bay. Um, and I kept thinking about those and that and what that what it would feel like to be within that space. But then it's also like, you know what? It needs to be a spaceship. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to hold on and I don't have to bring into a, a painful space. Let's 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 bring it up to a bring it to another space, you know, and it's um, like I was mentioning earlier about uh, the DNA strand, which was like these days you can go and get your DNA. You don't necessarily physically have to go to a particular place, but once you have that that makeup of you, who you are, it takes you a whole whole different place. It's almost when I think about like Marcus Garvey's and his movement to go go back to Africa, I think that, you know, that that knowing of oneself was probably like the most important thing. Mm. Radcliffe, you've also mentioned that you you view music as uh, as the first form of DNA. Right. Yeah, I, I think about like you know particular rhythms and how people respond to certain rhythms, and at the same time, it's like there's a reference, and you can trace like uh, you know a particular. I mean, of course, you could trace trace like James Brown and Fela. Uh, um, let me see, Ali Fakature and John Lee Hooker. Uh, you can kind of go on with different musicians back and forth and how they kind of they kind of go and they have, there's a relationship. And I've seen it before, you know, different documentaries where there are musicians and they find a kinship um, to uh, an artist in Africa or an artist in Africa finds a kinship to an artist in another part of the world in terms of certain make makeups or certain rhythm. There's certain rhythms in Cuba that you can, you can trace to, you know, relationships in West Africa too. So I always, I felt like, you know, you know, before there was DNA, we had to respond to music and sounds and rhythms and riffs. And, and I, and, you know, I think about it, you know, in that way. Mm. Thank you so much. Oh, great question. Uh, our next question will come from Catherine. Um, you should be able to turn on your microphone. Hi, hi Radcliffe. Hey. Um, thank you for your presentation today. I love your your sculptures in particular. I find them very meditative in these these kind of stations um, and especially the one, the, the pillar almost reminds me of the Hajj where you have the mm. pilgrimage that uh, the Saudi Arabia that people make these um, tours around the, the pillar. But um, I think what I wanted to ask you about the nature preserve, which kind of, um, you know, I lived in Illinois for three years and um, saw many nature preserves, but not art. I mean, nature, of course, is art, but uh, nothing really substantial as uh, formidable art pieces. And I was just curious about what the preserves are like in Atlanta. I visited Atlanta a long time ago, but I was just wondering um, how the nature preserves are they open to art statements or is it something new? Um, this is something somewhat that new. That is done. Uh, right, yeah, this is somewhat new. Uh, I think like uh, a lot of cities have, have followed the lead, I mean, followed uh, behind like the High Line and um, in New York. And so like Atlanta, we have like a, uh, an area called the Beltline, which is similar, similar kind of situations, but within these areas, they're installing art. But within the city of Atlanta, we're kind of known as a city within the trees, uh, a city within a forest. 
so we have old we have old forests and um oak trees and big and and uh, grand and the city owns this nature preserve but there are areas within the nature preserve i was commissioned about maybe four or five years ago now but within the nature preserve uh, the city owns it and they um they're improving on the nature preserve but it's also it's it's kind of like it's a weird space because you have you know you have another audience who is familiar with the battle of the creek and those are civil war bluffs and that's a whole different kind of energy and i think when i think about you know myself being commissioned to do this piece in the nature preserve it was more a response to being overloaded with all this confederate stuff energy and so i'm you know i'm kind of really like changing it a little bit um i'm not disturbing anything um and then there's another thing that happened during the pandemic everyone wanted to get out with it in nature everyone wanted to move around this was a this this was a nature preserve that you know once would see maybe on a good day 12 people but now this nature preserve sees about a couple hundred a day and it you know it was like a real kind of tucked away nature preserve there's like a fall and there's a spring and it's you know there was supposed to be waters were supposed to have healing powers in this nature reserve um but yeah yeah it's a different i've never i've never noticed um work in a nature reserve before but i'm also placing this this structure in an area uh, in an area where there was once a house and so the grounds are kind of clear so i'm kind of like almost putting i'm almost putting back up the foundation without a roof thank you, thank you. Uh, Jeffrey uh, has another question, so I'm going to pass the mic back to you, Jeffrey. Okay, great. Hey, um, yeah, I, I noticed this at, at the night of the opening of, of your show, and it was brought up earlier about um, the work going more toward abstraction, and particularly the piece at the end of the show of all the tracks kind of piled on top of each other. And I wonder for you whether going going into an abstract form like that is the same meaning in some other abstract way, or if it, in your mind, is it growing into something else that's beyond what you've done before? Hmm. I think I think I'm, I feel like I'm in the same place. I think that um, I'm just really I'm, I'm I feel like I'm dissecting older work and I'm dissect, dissecting the layers. And so within that one, I have like seven layers of tracks, but earlier works were like seven layers of actual paint or physical or, or seven layers of thought. But with that work, it's kind of like I'm, I'm picking apart certain parts of my work and becoming more minimal, but trying to figure out a way to be become more minimal, but then add more layers on top of that. So it's it's a funny little game I play with myself, and then a lot of it's really not necessarily about the subject matter, but it's about the materials. And so. do you see that as in your future? Mm, kind of, sort of, kind of, sort of. I'm changing. I'm I'm constantly trying to figure out new ways to re. I'm trying to reinvent myself every day. You know, I'm really trying to you know not become comfortable. Um, trying to put myself in an uncomfortable space, do things that are a little more difficult, um, thinking, about them, thinking about them in different ways. And I don't know, I don't know. I just don't, I actually don't really think about it. <laughs> you know, I don't, right. you know. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again, Jeffrey. Uh, our next question will come from um, Nick Bennett. You can turn on your mic. Hi, um, I want to thank you both, Radcliffe and Ksenia, so much for this conversation. Um, my question is in two parts. The first is kind of technical. Um, uh, Radcliffe, you'd mentioned that 
you were working with architects. And I was curious if you could say those names again of the particular ones that you worked with. But um, the part two of my question, which is a bit more broad, is how when you kind of embark on these collaborations, how do you sort of approach that process of collaboration? Or how do you decide which people or groups of people to work with? Um, OK, the architect's names are Max Scoggin and Meryl Elam. And they were architects who designed my home and my studio. So it was, it was kind of personal, but then also my resources are, you know, I like, I like um, local resources. I like, I, you know, I like the, the guy over in the corner, the guy down the street who makes cabinets. Um, I like the architects over here. I, I just try to reach as close as I can. And, you know, I have just a, a respect for what they do. Um, but I'm always working with uh, different kinds of people. And I know as I'm making a piece in New Orleans, um, I work with um, a company that basically does the, redoes the big oil drums, and which was, you know, real strange. But, um, but I enjoy working with, you know, just different people. Um, I don't really have a method to it either as well. I don't know. I did. I probably didn't answer your question. No, you did wonderfully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, that was great. Um, and our final question uh, will come from yes. Sean Hui, <laughs> um, our publisher, and over at the rail. Rockcliffe, you shall be. <laughs> 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 uh, and in case if the transcript is not full, I'm sure Cassinia can send a few more questions to make it complete later. But okay. I have the feeling that it's already there in this conversation. So thank you, Cassinia, also. Yeah, Radcliffe, we know each other a long time now, and I've been watching your work for a while. And in thinking about when, for example, um, our dear friend Jack, Witten passed away in 2018 um, in the winter, maybe in January, I think, that we invite quite a few friends who pay tribute to Jack and one of them being, um, of course, Stanley Whitney. So Stanley came to New York, first of all, he came to New York with the expectation that he would be a figurative painter, partly because he's so Bob Thompson in the, his voice. And I think Thompson, as you know, died tragically young. I mean, he, he died in 1966, he was 29, barely 29. And, but in thinking about so interestingly how Stanley began to sort of follow Jack footstep, Jack and his generation, there's no more than eight or nine African-American artists of Jack's generation very few of Stanley at the time. So that would include our loving William T. William, uh, Ed Clark and a few others. So interestingly, and how it had a profound effect on Stanley decidedly is that Jack did not want to make representational work like the way that Thompson did, although his painting is really extrapolate through the incredible synthesis of his admiration for Baroque painting in order to express the anxiety and everything else being a black painter in those days. But with Jack, decidedly that he's gonna explore abstraction, partly because he saw so many other his friends suffer from the race issue. It, it was eating them away. And he certainly didn't want to dumb down the viewer uh, in his work, super important to Stanley. Stanley wrote a beautiful tribute to Jack based on that early meeting. As you know, we all need our mentor, someone who we admire um, to trust what they have gone through in their own experience in order to inform ours. So that was very important to Stanley. At the day, he had that similar commitment to his abstraction and certainly enjoy this amazing reception at the moment. As you know, he's subject of several major exhibitions coming up. 
in Venice and the retrospective that will be at the Albright Knox Museum Gallery and so on. So my question is this, um, you know, Radcliffe, it, it, you know, we know younger African-American artists seem to be more leaning towards figuration and revisioning a certain historical context in their own narrative. But nevertheless, there's two strands. I mean, actually, bring it up uh, not long ago when I interviewed Theaster Gates at the same time at the other Gokoshan Gallery, there was Titus Kafar. It's two extreme opposite of representation. So my uh, question is very simple. I think you're one of the few artists who, who dare to bring the two representation and abstraction into one unification, pictorially speaking. Sometimes less of one or more of the other, but there's always that sense, a certain degree that you calibrate. So my question is that how, you know, how long and how much you have to sustain, because that's a very uh, delicate balance. Um, yeah, I... Well, I think of it like, I think of it just like I'm playing chess with myself. And some days I win, some days I lose, but I'm always winning as long as I'm really, um, you know, having that conversation with myself. I'm always, I mean, that's kind of the space where I'm at. I'm not really like, how can I say? Um, I'm in tune with myself. There are things I want to do there are things that are fast and then there are things that are slow. There are things that are, you know, more abstract and then there are things that are where the figure has to come and it's real important. And, you know, like some of my earlier, I mean, some of my other things, I really think of the photographs and those photographic images, I treat them like they're deities. And so they only come in at, you know, for certain reasons. And so I really allow those reasons to predict what I'm gonna do. I'm trying not to um, uh, follow moments. I'm really trying to really follow myself. It's hard. I mean, it's a strange thing. I mean, I think it's a strange thing to make art. I mean, I think that we're in this, you know, to make something from nothing, uh, to have something to say, Mm -hmm. and, and to feel as if maybe I don't have anything to say. Mm -hmm. um, it's weird, but I always, feel, I always feel as if I have something to say. But it's, it's I don't know. It's, I mean, it's a good question. Um, and I, I, I didn't know you peeped that or understood exactly. That's what I was kind of, there's a battle with myself. These two different Radcliffe's that are going on. I often, I often think of myself as having um, nine lives and I'm kind of somewhere in the middle with some of those lives. And each one of those, you know, there's, let's say there's like nine different people inside of me and, and they're all kind of playing within a concert amongst each other. And some, some of them jump out and play solo and they play with, they play on their own. And as long as I feel like I have access to that, I feel comfortable. Yeah, um, you talked earlier about you know maintaining your own perpetual struggle and making it more difficult for yourself um, right. to assert that sense of you know correspondence that correlate with the view as much as your own. You know when you are in the studio making. Right. And interesting though, Radcliffe, because you know in your work you seem to channel a certain condition of time, not specifically. Right. And I wonder what it means to you now, because, you know, certainly there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of open dialogue that really welcome um, all kinds of issues of race, certainly front and center that we are experiencing now. Uh, but nevertheless, you are one of the, you know, proponent, petitioner of this particular work for so long. So how do you, Think of time at particularly now, because I think I'm interested. We were going to talk about the other day and I forgot. Altogether. Okay. What do you mean? When you say time, you time mean right the now. time, 
the times we're living in right now. Yeah. And making work that kind of goes into a different time. Yeah. And it, I, I feel like, I feel like we're just reliving time over and over. I feel like we're going, we're going to a strange place in this country that it kind of reminds me, it makes me think about the, when I was born, which yeah. I didn't really completely understand. I mean, being a child that was born in 1968 and, you know, are we still fighting about voting rights? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, um, it's, it's real, it's real strange. I mean, I, it, I think during the pandemic, it be, you know, forced a lot of us to go inside and it forced a lot of us to go inside of ourselves. And yeah. uh, for me, it's more like go inside and, and, you know, operate with myself you know, work on myself. And, um, and I think that, you know, I'm not really like, I've never, never thought that I could make work to, to change, make a change for someone. I've always felt like I made work that was not really speaking to anyone else besides myself. Yes. Uh, and, and privately, you know, there are certain things that I desire and certain things I want to see. I want to see the world a particular way see this like that but those are part of the things that are not as evident for me those are the things that are kind of you know maybe that's the tear that mixes with the maybe that's the tear that mixes with the with the watercolor <laughs> you know maybe that's the you know there maybe that's the sand or the object that i picked from a particular place to um mix with something else um, you know, put together two colors that don't get along and try to create a harmony within that. Um, you know, you mix all colors together and come, always come up with the same color. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, things that juggle, jump around in my brain when I, uh, when I think about stuff like that. Yeah, well, we, we all know that, you know, no works of art will stop the bombing of Hiroshima Right. Saki or the war in Vietnam and everything else that perpetuated by human impulse to inflict violence to each other. We know that. But nevertheless, I was talking to uh, Sean Scully yesterday and his partner Lillian Tomasco. Somehow we referenced early on when I just recently reread, you know, Toro Civil Disobedient. That was written in 1849. That's sort of days after when he was in, j in jail for one night in refusing paying tax in Concord, Massachusetts, knowing the money will be going invested in the institution slavery and the war, the US war against Mexico. And it was so interesting because it was very important essay because when, you know, when um, Emerson came visit him and say, what are you doing in here, Henry? His response was, what are you doing? Why are you not in here? Mm -hmm. You know, so the point was that we know that it had a certain significant influence on Gandhi, on Dr. King and many other social activists, knowing that someone like yourself, Radcliffe, again, I'm talking way too long here to get to the point, you know, Ksenia. But the truth <laughs> is, you, you know, younger generation can be very angry, right. can be very angry and they would have tendency towards the impulse to exercise cancel culture. You know, as far as the suffering that we've been going through, tremendous suffering for so many years and decades, we have incrementally made some small progress. And I think that in art, we can say not quite the same because art doesn't make, doesn't become better. <laughs> we, <laughs> it will be hideous to say that, you know, Picasso is better than some K painter, you know, right. or, or <laughs> someone else is better than others. So my point is still the exercise making work of art still have an inherent moral power. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to allude to. Yeah. And you, do you feel that in your own work? I think so.
I think so. I don't want to stay, but yes, I think so. Okay. I, I think so. Radcliffe. I hope, <laughs> I hold it still forever. So here we are in front of those people. So yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Skashin. Yeah. Radcliffe, good to see you, brother. Back to you, Anya. <laughs> Thank you, Fong. Uh, what a beautiful way to close out this conversation. Thank you so, so much, Radcliffe and Ksenia. This has been truly wonderful. Um, I can't wait to revisit this uh, uh, later once it's um, published on our website. Um, and at the rail, we have a tradition of closing out our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Isabel Sobral Campos, to the stage. She will be reading the work of Portuguese writer Salet Tavares as her translator. So Isabel Sobral Campos' new book is How to Make Words of Rebel. Other works include Your Person Doesn't Belong to You, Autobiographical Ecology, and Sobriety Crystal. Her poetry has appeared in the Boston Review, the Brooklyn Rail, in the anthologies Bax 2018 and Poetics for the More Than Human World and Elsewhere. And she is the co-founder of the Sputnik and Fizzle publishing series. And Salet Tavares was a Portuguese writer, theorist, and visual artist. She was a member of the experimental poetry group POX and was involved in the publication of the first issues of Poesia Experimental. Her books include Quadrada, Lex Icon, Obra Poetica, and Poesia Grafica. Her spatial poems were exhibited at the 2014 retrospective Salet Tavares Spatial Poetry at the Calouste Gulbenkian Museum in Lisbon. So please, Isabel, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, really nice to be here today and hear this great conversation. And happy today to read um, from forthcoming translation that I actually did collaborate with my partner, but of Lex Icon, a 1971 book. And um, this book, all the poems in the book are um, about objects, everyday objects, and sort of how they reveal in this foundational way how we relate, but also their potential to be sort of spatial poems, which then becomes these special poems and art objects in themselves. Lots of play with language and teasing out words that are sleeping inside of words, so it's like nesting in there. So uh, that was the challenge of translating some of this and some of, some of that I'll read, I'll try, I'll do my best. And I'll read the first one in Portuguese, the toilet, tablecloth, and then another one in English. I'll read in Portuguese, I'll read in English, and I'll read just in English. A toalha. Em cima da mesa está uma toalha. Em cima da mesa o quadrado, o branco, o liso, a luz de uma toalha. 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 O quadrado talha, o branco brilha, o liso molha, a luz cintila. Uma toalha ilha, a grande mesa flor de uma toalha branca, de uma toalha linho, alva vincada. A ilha da toalha é habitada e os pratos que a habitam são os seus nenúmferas de louça a flutuar. As grandes pétalas de louça ensalada pela rede da malha larga do talher. Os copos são a luz cristalizada da toalha, as lâmpadas acesas do vinho e da água. Enquanto os pratos dançam e as malhas metálicas se fazem e desfazem, a toalha sempre branca mancha e a lampidez salpica-se de migalhas de sãs. Na ilha luminosa dos nenúferos brancos, a louça, os talheres e os cristais cantam, enquanto sobre o quadrado de luz as presenças do pão, do vinho e da água deixaram cair as gotas breves e simpáticas que atestam a verdade do linho, pano alvo manchado, que traduz a comunhão de todos no convívio dos corpos. Assim, à beira de uma toalha, à sua beira, se acolhem as linhas divididas a distâncias que separam as vidas. Depois levanta-se a toalha sobre a ausência e a tristeza reina. Apenas nos resta a certeza do retorno, porque é eterna. Uma toalha, uma toalha, uma toalha. A palavra parte da garganta para a boca, como se se lavasse entretanto, como se entrasse numa máquina de lavar. Toalha, sai pronta, seca, esticada, em cima da mesa de novo quadrado. And this is our translation of tablecloth. 
Upon the table rests a tablecloth. Upon the table, the square, the white, the smooth, the light of a tablecloth, tail cloth, table cloth. The square sculpts, the white flickers, the smooth soaks, the light sparkles, a tablecloth aisle, the large bouquet of a white tablecloth, of a linen tablecloth, alabaster creased. Tablecloth aisle is populated, and the plates that live there are floating water lilies of flatware, great petals of crockery entangled. In the webbed mesh that silverware loosens, glasses the tablecloth's crystallized light. It lit lamps of wine and of water. While plates dance and metallic mesh tangles, sing tangles, the ever white tablecloth stains, its clarity sprinkled with sane crumbs. In the luminous aisle of white nenuphers, crockery, cutlery, and crystal chant, while on the square of light, presences of bread, wine, and water shed ephemeral and pleasant droplets, attesting to the truth of linen, stained target fabric, translating communion of all into a coexistence of bodies. Like this on a tablecloth's edge on its edge, shelter divided lines, distances separating lives. Afterwards, raise the tablecloth over absence and sadness reigns. We are left with a certitude of return since it is eternal. A tablecloth, a table cloth, a table cloth. The word departs from throat to mouth as if bathing in between, as if inside a washing machine, a tail cloth, it emerges willing, dry, scratch, stretched upon the table top again, square. And then for the sake of time, I'll just read another poem. It's called Losaido, and this is cabinet. You put um, your cutlery and stuff. Cabinets are doors without, boxes within, splayed wooden shelves, crockery throats, nests of class and crystal. Cabinets are musical instruments. They have massive and voluminous exterior bellies, finished like pianos and violins. Doors muzzle their clamorous guts and gaze as if listening. Cabinets are always stuffed with mysteries, with chatter that does not cease, and its sonorous maw is breached only when the door opens. It has the mouth of a whale or a hippopotamus, and when it opens, one hears nothing but creaking jaws. At first, they speak without listening, just a mouth agape, but the music is immediately perceptible. This is an instrument of every note. Even those which at one point, imagine, were prohibited, were not even notes, or more precisely, were known. A china cabinet is a modern instrument, almost a recording studio. So when cabinets make music, they have a singular conception of composition. Like John Cage, they build because they know the lecture on nothing. Cabinets are dormant yet pregnant with sound. They are veritable armories, the richer for waiting than anything else. Their concert is an interminable cycle of consecutive days in the absolute mathematical continuity of time. The expressions are rigorously syncopated. At the same time, every day, aleatory musical equivalents repeat silences, snapping of porcelain or glass and feather in a storm of fingers and hands, the breathing of furious or delicate winds beget the sonorous Zen counterpoint to the dry or lukewarm response of wood, plates, glass, glasses, teacups, trays, all the dishware filling and emptying the cabinet like a wind instrument. At times they are suspended, halting intersections define their individuality and con confidence in their concrete intimacy. Again, the silent glide, a silence, silence, the shut cabinet. Even so, you hear a scream, a squeal deep within. Nothing impedes the crystalline, and no one knows why several sonic winds appear in this order. No one knows why, always timed, rigorous, disorderly. Cabinets possess the Buddhist ability of things turn natural after being wise. Thank you. 
and thank you for for everything. (laughs) Thank you so much, Isabel. That was such a perfect uh, ending to this conversation. I feel like that really fit into um, everything we spoke about today. So thank you so much uh, for that gorgeous reading. And thank you again uh, to Radcliffe, to Ksenia, and to Jack Shaneman Gallery for helping to organize this event. Um, We encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel where we'll upload today's conversation shortly. And you can join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation between James Lawrence and Fong H. Bui. And we'll conclude that with Diane DePrima's Revolutionary Letters read by Micah Ballard. So uh, you should now be able to turn on your microphones and say thank you and goodbye. Thank you. 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 Thank <laughs> no. <laughs> and go see the show, okay, Radcliffe? Sure. The show, there's two shows right now. Simultaneously, as Jack Salmon. Remain there till Ksenia? Oh, God. Well, I just went up. Uh... December 18th. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Don't put me on the spot. Great shows, Radcliffe. Great shows. Great show. Great show, Radcliffe. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you, you guys. Thank you. 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 Thank